As you've s heard already, Karen Washington deserves uh, so much accolade, but she's also very hard to introduce. She's a pretty amazing individual. Um, and I loved her introduction this morning for any of you who weren't here. She said, I'm a farmer and I'm an advocate. And I think those are really fundamentally important aspects of her and her personality and who she is. She cares so much. She has so much passion about the soil, about people, about engagement. I can't tell you how many events she's attended where she tries to bring to the fore these issues of justice. She, is, she, she embodies the importance of these issues. We need w many more Karen Washingtons. And I don't want to take up too much time, but. Keep going, keep going, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> Well, I also have to say, I was one. I wrote my introduction. I was going to talk about bugs because I just love that name. I mean, not only is it amazing to figure out ways for Black people to come together and share and see others that they can learn from and and be in a room with people who are passionate and similar to them, but it's also a cool name and something that makes you know it, it's just fun. Okay, so that's Karen. Fun. So welcome back again, I guess. Um, so I'm Karen Washington. I'm a farmer, like I said, from the very beginning. I grow food, I feed people, body and mind. And usually when I do this workshop on food justice and food sovereignty, I have it somewhat interactive. So I'm gonna see how I can sort of swing this so that um, I don't stand up here and do a lot of the talking, but getting your really thinking about what food justice and food sovereignty is all about. So let me s first begin uh, about how I got started in my activism and how a lot of us got started in activism. So go back 30 years ago when New York City at one time had over 15,000 vacant lots, mostly in low-income neighborhoods and neighborhoods of color. And when you look at this, this slide, you know, I say to myself, you know, I've been around cities such as Baltimore and Philly and um, Oakland, and believe it or not, there are communities of color that still look like this. And so for me, moving into the Bronx back in the, in the late 1980s, buying a, a new home um, and feeling that maybe my American dream was something that I could fulfill Across the street was an empty lot. So my American dream quickly became my American nightmare. And people who could leave, left. People who could leave, left. But those who remained had to fight off drug dealers, um, prostitution at that time, crack cocaine was very prevalent, and had no resources. So believe it or not, people got together and turned those empty lots into what you see now our community gardens and urban farms. So when we talk about the food movement here in the city, it really wasn't about food. It really was about taking back our communities and doing something um, productive. And that, something, that thing that was productive was growing flowers and plants to make our neighborhoods more attractive. And now that I'm doing a lot of work around food and social justice, I can say that first slide, was the beginning of a conversation of what we call environmental racism. Because you see in a lot of low-income neighborhoods, and especially neighborhoods of color, you'll see, again, garbage, um, empty lots, incinerators, waste disposal, um, buildings. And so I just want to bring to the forefront how important people in low-income neighborhoods have been, the resiliency that they've had and to make these empty lots into community gardens was very, very difficult because as you can see, there are communities that are now being gentrified. And you hear people saying that it's because these community gardens are the result of gentrification, but I beg to differ. Uh, also, just a little point in terms of history, how we got to this point in time is the fact that in 1998, when we had the confidence of the city, the mayor then Giuliani tried to auction off 100 community gardens in the dead of night without any notification. And so one thing about any sort of movement is complacency. And so what was happening was complacency, figuring that because we turned these empty lots into community gardens, that the city was okay with that. But once he started to auction off community gardens, I think it was a wake-up call. So the movement that we have today in New York City 
is based on activism and that complacency. So just a, a uh, thought of reference about community gardens and urban farms uh, that are still coming up now against the word urban agriculture, maybe that's for another talk, and biotechnology. And so for me doing this, this movement, getting involved in what we are calling social justice uh, movement came with a new vision for me, came with the territory of looking at uh, my community through different lens. And first of all, I still, I still live in a low income neighborhood um, and we are called marginalized, low income, all these different sorts of names that we're called. However, people don't understand the resiliency of people who live in quote poor neighborhoods, the fact that they have limited resources. And so for me, I had to change my lens on how I looked at my community because for so long people were telling me that my community was a, a community that latched on to problems and deficits. So for me, I had to change that lens to look at my community in terms of resiliency, in, in, in terms of assets, in terms of strength and um, also change my focus not only about growing food because you know for me and for a lot of people we concentrate on growing food because we feel that you know food is the the number one priority in our neighborhood but if you look at this slide what's really really important is the intersection that food plays the intersection that food plays in health economics housing and our environment and if you look at these sectors in this country it definitely falls along race geographic and economic lines, usually in low, low income neighborhoods and poor folks, which are usually at the bottom. And when we talk about poor and poverty, I wanna make a note that sometimes people equate um, poor being urban, but poor is urban and rural. So I just wanna make that point. The struggle for good health and food and education and housing is an issue of racial and social justice because it brings to the surface the social economic disparities we see often in communities of color. And when we don't intersect food into the social and economic issues and place value on it, it feeds into a system that is already dominated by a few white men. Food alone has no power, but when you put power on it and value on it becomes powerful. The next slide talks about the word food security, which was coined back in 1996, if you can look at this slide. And it's when all people at all times have access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food to maintain a healthy, active life. Now, I'm giving you this definition because at one time the word safe really wasn't added to the conversation of this definition until 2002. But it brings the definition of food security in terms of three pillars, and that is availability, access, and safety. And that the lack of these sufficient qualities of food available on a consistent basis, the absence of the fact that we have limited availability, limited access, and limited safety, really are some of the causes of what we now call food insecurity. Again, a word that is troublesome because is it really food security or is it really based on um, racism and other isms that we are, are really suffering from. So what keeps me going, keeps me up each and every day is thinking about hunger and poverty. And so I ask myself and I ask you know, people in the food system is how in a country so great as uh, the United States that we have hunger and poverty. 40 million people still fall within the poverty line. 11% between 18 and 64. 18% for children under the age of 18. And even our seniors. And so I ask you to think about, we're talking about food and justice, food, uh, food justice and food sovereignty. This is a main, main sticking point for me because of the fact that there's this misinformation, the fact that um, we don't 
grow enough food. Well, we do grow enough food. We waste enough food. The fact is, is that that food is not getting down to the people that need it the most. And so if we're going to talk about what food justice and food sovereignty is all about. We need to talk about why do we have a broken food system which really encourages people to get their food from a charity-based system and also teaches us not to talk about the value and cost of food. And so this is another subject that I want to talk about because, again, I think we heard it from the two uh, previous um, talks when we talked about food deserts. So I want everyone in the audience to say food deserts because that's the last time you're going to say it because I use the word food apartheid. And I say that because when people were using the term food desert to really describe my community, a community that has limited amount of access to grocery stores, to healthy food, what they did not realize is that we do have food. What we don't have is the right food. We don't have healthy food, so that's one thing. And then we were hearing from people in the deserts and saying that, you know, we do have food, so how can you equate uh, low-income neighborhoods in terms of food deserts? So when I coined the term food apartheid, I coined it in such a way because I wanted to bring to the forefront the fact of racism and economics and geographical issues really at the forefront of a lot of issues. And then when you talk about food apartheid, it, it brings into a system where one half of society has opulence and the other half of the society doesn't. And so it brings up a conversation that we need to have between those, have, those who have and those who don't have. So now you know a new term, which is food apartheid. And so for years, people have been telling uh, people in low-income neighborhoods that you know if they eat healthy and they drink water um, and they eat the right, this form of pyramid uh, that the USDA has set forth, that it would end some of the food insecurity that we have. But so I looked at the pyramid and I said, you know, I'm going to dismantle the pyramid and come up with my concept. And so I believe that in my neighborhood, we are bogged down by three food groups. First is the junk food. Next is the fast food, but I'm not going to tell you what the last one is. So first of all, I'm going to talk to you about the junk food because one of the biggest marketing um, systems that in place is the color of fruits and vegetables. So you can walk into my neighborhood and you can see the colors of fruits and vegetables, but if you look at the packaging, it's empty calories and ingredients that we cannot pronounce. If you look at the fast food chains that we have in our neighborhood, and let me just tell you, I'm, I live in the Bronx. On every corner, there's a fast food restaurant. There's a Wendy's, a Subway. There's a Caesars pizza. And there's this thing called Kennedy Chicken. So if someone can tell me who owns Kennedy Chicken, um, they can let me know. And then the last thing of the food groups of my pyramid is something that was supposed to revolutionize the 20, 20th century, and that is the processed food, the TV dinner. So those are the three things that I see in my community. Um, so when people talk about changing the dynamics of the food system, we also have to think about what's in our neighborhood, which is the processed food, the junk food, and the um, fast food. So um, many voices from agriculture, food science and agriculture will tell you that, again, if we get people to eat healthy and we provide healthy food options and, and have them drink water and, and, and ban soda and put a tax on soda, uh, that people will be more food secure. But the thing about it is that in order to talk about food justice in a way, we have to understand some of the injustices that are happening within our neighborhood. And I say that because I do a lot of work around food justice and food sovereignty. Those words, well, I'll get a chance to talk about that in a second, have been co-opted and mean really nothing to me. So when I get to the point where we talk about food justice and food sovereignty, we'll talk a little bit more about that. 
So I tell people if we're going to talk about this whole realm of the food system, then we have to understand some of the social injustices that continue to plague our communities and communities of color. And if you look at some of the things that are brought to the forefront, we need to talk about racism, gender class, and inequality. Some things that we continue not to talk about and continue to shy away from. You know, we've heard time and time again, just because we've had a black president, that racial issues have subsided. But now, with the current political plight that we have, as you can see, racism is definitely surfacing and raising its uh, ugly head. Uh, if you look at the lack of opportunity to be self-sufficient and self-reliant, which is really, really important because there is a savior mentality when it comes to fixing some of the food system problems that we have in low-income neighborhoods and neighborhoods of color. And I tell people, we don't need no fixing. Mm -hmm. We already know how to do things. But what we do need is people to think about bringing their resources bringing their resources, sharing their wealth, and sharing their power, something that we will talk about, about later. Again, changing the lens and how do you perceive poor people in terms of deficits and problems and making sure that you change that lens into resiliency and strength because it's a population of people who have had no resources or little resources and were able to survive. Next is lack of land, big, big problem. I think we talked about it um, earlier, the fact that uh, we have an aging population of farmers, the average age of a farmer is now 58 years of age, and if we don't encourage a new group of young farmers to come into um, the system, then we are going to have a big, big problem feeding ourselves. So lack of land also here in the city, lack of land in the city. And so people are using innovative ideas along with technology. Uh, I saw in the first um, session today, we're talking about vertical farming. Um, that's, a touchy, that's a touchy system because when we have biotechnologies, biotechnology talking about ways of improving the system, but like one size fit all and it's the cure all. I have a problem with that because most of the food that are grown in greenhouses and vertical farms are really not the mainstay of of food that's going to feed the world. What about the grains and you know and um beans and stuff like that? And so we're constantly thinking about this elitist type of food that's going to sort of save the world whereby I don't think I can just eat lettuce or kale. So something to, so, to think about um, when we talk about um, the lack of land and looking at ways to um, preserve land. When we talk about economics, this is really, really um, crucial for me in the terms in the realm of food justice and the fact that I live in the Bronx and when I talk about a charity-based system, I don't want to offend anyone in the fact that um, we do have a charity-based system of food pantries and soup kitchens, which are uh, tremendous and which are really essential for people in need of food. But what I'm finding out is that in certain instances, it's become people's way of living. And so for me, um, I'm just tired of people coming into poor neighborhoods with the idea that all they have to do is sign you up for more food stamps and uh, here's the nearest uh, food pantry and, and welfare that is going to help the system. But my idea is about job creation and financial literacy. is for companies to come into my neighborhood with the idea and with the incentive of job creation, of entrepreneurship, of ownership. Could you imagine, each and every day I think about, could you imagine if our neighborhood had the Microsofts and the Amazons and people uh, were able to have living wage jobs and to be able to uh, provide for themselves? So um, just think about reaching out into neighborhoods in terms of financial liter literacy job creation, and that means bringing in your resources and your knowledge so that people have, an ac have access to economics. Next, last understanding the historical content of trauma, which is really, really important 
even though things have been 100, 200 years ago, there is an element of trauma which has been documented that weaves in from generation to generation. So we need to really sort of con confront trauma um, in low-income neighborhoods or in neighborhoods and populations that have been really um, pressured through oppression, racism, stuff like that. And the last thing we need to talk about, we'll talk about very soon, is power. And that is power over. Power is a drug, um, as we'll talk about later. It's a drug. And so we need to think about either sharing your power or giving it up. And so I tell people time and time again, if you're not going to give, uh, if you're not going to uh, share your power, I'm going to take it. And so how do we expect our people to eat healthy, feed their families, stay in good health, pay rent, send their kids to school without a good paying job? So often these injustices invoke the term food justice and food sovereignty. So how many of you have heard of the term food justice? Very good. How many of you have heard the term food sovereignty? That's even better. So when I tell people about food justice and food sovereignty, it means nothing to me. It means nothing to me because both words have been co-opted. You know, I can ask you to give me that cookie cutter definition about what food justice is, and then you're going to say to me, I know a little bit more, so I'm going to add food sovereignty, and then I'm going to bring it up to another level. And I'm here to tell you that food justice and food sovereignty means nothing to me because they are both terms that are active. And I say that because if you're going to talk about food justice, what are you doing? What are you doing to stem the tide of injustice? When you're talking about food sovereignty, which has been co-opted here in the United States because the word food sovereignty comes from the global south. And it comes from indigenous people who are trying to fight for governance, governance and political power. And so we We've taken that term and co-opted to mean, you know, more in terms of getting more land um, into the conversation when we talk about food justice. So for me, food justice is an active transformational thing that we need to talk about, and it stems from understanding what justice is all about. And so what I usually have people at this time to really think about is that how does food justice show up in your work? When we talk about food justice, again, it's transformational, it's active, it's what you're doing, it's not the definition. What are you doing to stem the tide of the injustices that you see in the food movement? Complacency does not work. Giving a definition does not work. What are you actively doing to change the food system so then you can talk about your work in, along food justice? When we talk about food sovereignty, again, it's a term that we've co-opted, mostly from the global south, mostly in terms of their fight, again, for governance, right for people, and right for access to land. Both advocate for greater control over food production and consumption by people who have been marginalized by those with power. The goal of a greater control tends to be associated with less dependency on capital in intensive inputs, greater attention to the social and economic context, and the creation of a supply network that contributes to the sy systemic well-being, and I'm talking about social capital, rather than those merely do, their merely purpose is to extract value. In principle, both place equity in the decision-making process and the distribution of resources when it comes to what we call the soul good food movement. Some scholars and practitioners, racial in racial inequality 
is the central concern of food justice, while in food sovereignty, it's more oriented towards self-determination, global uneven development, and ecological degradation. Perhaps we've come full circle in terms of trying to integrate both food justice and food sovereignty. However, make no mistake that in nonprofit organizations, people have been using food justice to pad their mission statements, to pad their vision, and to use this term to forward their own agenda in terms, uh, terms of applying for food-related programs such as anti-obesity education, growing vegetables, value-added production, immigrant and farmer programs, buying local campaigns and farmers markets. If we're going to use, again, the word food justice, then we have to really have to expand our non-knowledge and what that means and how are we able to promote justice if we're not doing the work actively. One thing we have to think about is how power enters the equation. Power is like a drug. You got to have it. It's difficult to give it up because as long as the food system embraces power, society will remain stagnant, stagnant and resistant to change. So how often do we think about power in the food system? How often do we go into a supermarket and ask the grocer, has that vegetable been sprayed with pesticide or insecticide? Has the worker who behind the scene, have they been treated humanely or given a living wage? So we talk about a sustainable food system that's supposed to be fair, just and equitable from farmer to consumer. What meaning does it have if we're not following the dots from the person that puts that seed in the ground to where your food is delivered on your plate? So I got the definition right here. So when we talk about the power dynamics of food, how does it show up? So when you don't have it, the power dynamics of food shows up as hunger. When you can't afford it, poverty. When it's killing you, diet-related diseases. When you feel you don't deserve it because someone told you the, that organics was better, but in your neighborhood you don't have organics, and when others control it, such as Big Ag. But yet there are people doing things to change the power dynamics of food justice and food sovereignty. They are reclaiming land and forming community land trusts. They're growing food that is culturally appropriate that they can afford. So there's a big problem in terms of organics, and that is the fact that in some instances, organics is deemed elitist, affluent, rich people food, or hippie food. So we have to be careful about how we use words and language when we talk about food. The next thing is saving seeds, which is really, really critical. Again, if we're going to talk about food justice and food sovereignty, how is it that we have allowed a small population of corporations saving our seeds? What right do they have in saving our seeds? Again, if we're going to talk about food justice, then we have to make sure that our seeds remain open that no corporation is allowed to save seeds. Because if you look at the essence of the population, uh, seeds are part of our DNA. And every, every minute, every second that we speak, we are losing the diversity of plants and animals. They're growing herbs for, he for healing and medicine. And this dates back to a lot of the conversation that we have in terms of indigenous property and storytelling and how for so many years 
there have been a healing quality that a lot of people have been used have been using to heal some of the ailments that they have but yet their information has been co-opted to large pharmaceutical companies so that they can make money off that knowledge forming cooperative leveraging power using urban and rural connection to talk to one another for instance in the bronx out of 62 counties in New York State, the Bronx ranks 62 as the most unhealthiest county in New York State. 61 is Sullivan County. So what we're trying to do is to meet both urban and rural to talk about some of the problems that we have plaguing our neighborhoods, working together this urban and rural connection. Rewriting history, as I said from the very beginning, it's very, very common to find a different narrative that you will see in a textbook or in an academic class. So it's really important that the stories are told from the people who have been working at the forefront of agriculture. Columbus did not discover America. America was already here. Forming community-based farmers markets, again, something that was not seen years ago in community um, communities of color, when asked for us to do a farmer's market, we were told, number one, farmers can't come to the Bronx or Harlem because it's too far. Number two, farmers can't come to the Bronx because poor people won't be able to afford fresh produce. And number three, communities of color, it's dangerous. So if we take and peel back that myth, well, in order for farmers to get to 14th Street, they have to go through the Bronx and Harlem. As in, in terms of communities of, of, of color and poor people can't afford food, but if you put, some, put them all together per capita, they spend a lot of money on food. And number three, these communities are dangerous. Well, like any other community, these communities are being gentrified. Again, supporting small and local farmers, this is a big push that we need to do if we're gonna talk about what food just and food sovereignty looks like, is for us to think about the power that we have, the monetary power that we have, the political power that we have to make sure that we help and support small and local farmers. And again, having conferences and workshops that talk and, uh, and, and, and talk about and discuss issues by people who look like them. So these are some of my friends around the country that are doing work around really taking back the narrative about what food and social justice uh, really is. Again, looking at justice in terms of activism, a transformative activism, looking at food sovereignty in terms of helping the uh, Global South in their initiative around governance, around land, around seed saving. One point I'm really willing to, to, to talk to you about is also the fact that, you know, we don't talk about labor when it comes to food and, and food and social justice, and we need to talk about labor because I want you to think how many times you go to a restaurant, do you think about that plate, that 20 or $30 plate that you're eating, what's behind that plate? and sometimes labor goes unnoticed, who is that person in the kitchen that's getting paid 50 cents an hour? Who is the person in the field who is planting and harvesting, not getting a living wage, spending hours, no health insurance? What about the workers, the distributors, the handlers, all these people in terms of labor we need to talk about in the food movement if we're gonna talk about food and social justice? And one thing I want people to be cognizant of about and something that we're working on is to change the frame of the narrative around farm workers because they're not farm workers, they are indeed farmers. So what action steps can you take to change the context and the, and the, and the conversation around food and social justice? Well, First one is the power of ask, asking. So the next time you are in a room where we're talking about sustainability, because again, I don't know what that means, but food justice, but any food conference, and we're talking about marginalized community or people of color, 
just make sure that when you look around the conference, who needs to be in the conversation and who's missing. Again, outreach is not engagement. Just because you get on the on your the the computer and email to invite people, that is not engagement. Share and tell your stories. Like I said from the very beginning in the earlier panel, that I tell my youth to take out those uh, iPhones and Samsung Galaxy and document your history. Especially, we need to uplift the voices of women and people of color because it's women who have been really at the forefront of agriculture. Break bread and share a meal with someone you don't know. Make yourself feel uncomfortable to be comfortable. In many s circumstances, we go and we sit by ourselves. Um, when we leave the room here, we'll go on our merry way. But if we're going to really think about what food justice is all about, that is making yourself feel uncomfortable to be comfortable. Meet, meet farm, farmers need to meet farmers, and farmers need to get to know their consumers, and consumers need to know your farmers. A conversation that needs to be had within communities, marginalized communities, is the cost and value of food. And that's a conversation that I have um, constantly with my community because again, we're in a system of charity. And so as a farmer, I have to make people understand there's a cost and the value of the food that I bring uh, from my farm down to the Bronx. For instance, um, I had someone come and said that my $2 carrots were too expensive and that they can get the same bunch of carrots from the grocery store for 99 cents. And so I had to educate that consumer, the fact that I'm the farmer, I bought the seed, I planted it, I harvested it, I brought it down from upstate to the Bronx, I paid tolls, I paid gas, and I need to feed my family. And so with that education, I'm not saying it was 100%, but with that education, 90% of my clientele and my consumers in my neighborhood understand the cost and value of food. And so we need to have that conversation when we talk about uh, food in marginalized community and that use it as a ploy for them to sign up for the nearest food pantry or soup kitchen. One thing I say about empowerment and power, if you want to give a community that was powerless and have them deemed powerful, then there's three things that we need to do in this food movement. That's number one, provide opportunity, capital, and land. If we can do those three things, we're on the right page. And last but not least, which is really, really important, is to help develop and promote youth leadership. So I hear the outcries from a lot of youth is that they want to work but they don't always want to work on a volunteer basis. That we need to somehow provide the opportunity to promote leadership, pr promote leadership skills, but also think about how we can engage them in terms of entrepreneurship, in terms of, um, of making money and getting money. So those are your action steps and that's your homework assignment. Um, for today, again, when I usually do this presentation, I have, it's interactive, so what I want you to take home and get a chance to do this presentation around food sovereignty and food justice is that I have people draw it. When you're talking about food justice and food sovereignty, what does food justice look like? Draw it. What does food sovereignty look like? draw it. And through the drawings, you'll get an understanding about what food justice means to people, but also what food justice and food sovereignty, what are the parts that are missing when we talk about it. So once again, thank you for listening to what I have to say. Again, I leave you with this. To grow your own food gives you power. You know who and why you grew it. You grew it for yourself, your family, and your community. Peace out.